welcome back to Beyond the Box Office, episode three, and we have a fucking awesome episode for you. My name is Bam Sam. I'm your host. With me again this week is Loz. Say hello, Loz. Hello. How you doing? Good. And Steve. Say hello, Steve. Hello, but I'm not happy about being cut fucking third. What the fuck? I've fallen down the pecking order. Who am I? <laughs> am I Jurassic Park 3? No, didn't think so. Anyway, yes, hello, people out there. It's going in alphabetic order. Bam, Sam, Laws, and Steve. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck, fuck you and your logic. <laughs> right, so, um, yeah, as I said, we've got an awesome episode lined up. Um As well as the usual news and reviews, etc., we have an ex. No, it's not an exclusive, a very special interview with Steve. Fry, Fry, Fry. That's right, Alan Ruck from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And Speed, and Twister, and Spin <laughs> City. <laughs> and Star Trek Generations! <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah, we were, we we're lucky enough that he agreed to come on and chat with us for a while, so... We'll stick that in the pod, so you'll hear that shortly, and uh, we'll have a little discussion about it after, and then um, move on. So, um, right, before we get started, uh, we have a Twitter account now, which is at Box Office Beyond, and also we have a YouTube channel, um, which was just Steve's one, and we changed the name, so just search Beyond the Box Office on YouTube, and um, we still haven't got a website, but we're working on it. Um, okay, so, news, who wants to go first? Anyone? <laughs> Did everyone just step back beyond the line? Like, no, no, no. <laughs> everyone was like, uh, "Have I got news?" Or? <laughs> there's not a lot of news out there, to be honest. There's some, like, I mean, there's some bits and pieces. I managed to like find two things I was interested in. Yeah, the, the reason I asked you first was because I was like, I didn't have any, and I'm like, <laughs> "Wow, what's what's happened in the it last?" Is, it is pretty bland out there. Obviously, with all the new, uh, summer films coming out right now, most things aren't news because they've be, already been released. And even things like Guardians of the Galaxy, which, uh, Lawrence, you want to talk about later on, there's not, obviously, news. Uh, but one thing that did break uh, this week was um, Superman's new suit and the new title for Terminator 5, formerly Terminator Genesis. It's not Terminator. If they confirmed it as being called the Terminator. No, no. But did you oh, not no. see what I wrote to you? It's it was they, where were them pictures from? It was the um, the it was the expo, wasn't it? It's the licensing expo. Yeah, but they do. It's not That's not the name of the new film. That's just a, for the licensing expo. They're just saying this is a property that's coming in two thousand and fifteen or whenever. I honestly, I I wouldn't be so sure on it because think about it, right, Rocky. Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4, Rocky 5, Rocky Balboa. Yeah, it's just... First Blood, Rambo First Blood Part 2, Rambo 3. Yeah, but it's Rambo. also, you got to think it's a licensing expo, which means there's going to be a shit ton of, like, Terminator games and that. So, you know, they're just putting out the Terminator name, just like they did last year when they full well knew it was going to be called Jurassic World. They stuck the Jurassic Park 2015 one. They stuck the... Fast and Furious 2014, even though um, it got pushed back because of the unfortunate death of Paul Walker. But it it's just a licensing expo. It's, you know, unless the name's 100% confirmed down on paper, they're not going to spend all this money promoting it at the licensing expo when the name could potentially change. Well, I don't know. I mean, OK, the fact is that we've been running with the thought that Terminator 5 would be called Terminator Genesis and now suddenly we get this massive post that's Terminator, ter- just Terminator 2015 and this raises massive questions as I said because is it like Rambo I mean and if it is Terminator where do I place it in my DVD collection do I put it before the Terminator after Terminator Salvation Terminator 2 what I mean what is going on with this I, I, I'm happy that it's not Terminator Revenge of the T-800 or some shit. But, because I'm, I'm sick and tired of cliche bullshit like Resurrection, Revenge, Rise of the Planet of the Terminators or something. Actually, that's a good one. But this is the thing. It wasn't... No sort of mainstream sites reported it. It was all sort of, you know, like, second-rate sites and nothing blogs like Rewind that <laughs> reported it. <laughs> 
Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just like they're posting the name of the franchise. Yeah, like, exactly. Terminator. We've got the franchise coming out, so it's going to yeah. be awesome. A new a like, new product in the franchise will be available in 215. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I, I think I'll put... Because it's a Terminator I, license. I will put a yeah. whole pound right now that basically <laughs> this film is going to be called Terminator. <laughs> I just choked because you were in a whole pound on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one whole... That's about one pound 48, isn't it, for American <laughs> listeners? Uh, one dollar uh, 48 for American. One, uh, one whole <clears throat> Starship Troopers, <clears throat> I know, futuristic credit pound, Demolition Man, <laughs> you've been fined one credit <laughs> that it will be called Terminator. I guarantee it will be called Terminator. Would you like it? Can't be, because isn't the first one... The Terminator. Isn't that yes. too close to it? Like, it seems just... Hmm. Yeah, nah. but you say that about Rambo, but it wasn't called Rambo, was it? It was called First Blood. Yeah, it was First Blood. First, uh, it was First Rocky Blood. Rocky was Rambo. Rocky, and Rocky Balboa is Rocky Balboa. Yeah, but I reckon they're going to call it Terminator. No bullshit. They will. It'll be The Terminator, Terminator 2, then just Terminator, because no one counts Rise of the Fucking <coughs> Shit and Salvation. Salvation's good. Yeah, it's alright, but it's not a Terminator film. It has Terminators in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we finish with your little rant or anyone else got any news? Because other than sort of just new images and new trailers, sort of like a, a ten second extended version of the trailer we've already seen of films. You know, there is actually nothing there's been no major confirmations of new films and things like that. No, I mean, nothing other than, obviously, um, <clears throat> Superman's, like, latest suit kind of, like, leaked picture from Zack Snyder. I really, really am liking where Zack Snyder <laughs> is going with this franchise. He's really taken... I mean, it's a risk. He's definitely taking a risk, but he's really differentiating himself, setting himself apart from Marvel, going, no, we're going down this more artistic look, this more 300 Sin City stylized look, a bit like Tim Burton went, yeah, okay, you see Batman in the 60s, <clears throat> this is my Batman now. Zack Snyder's going for that with, obviously, um, Batman versus Superman, sorry, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Mm. I like it. Lars, you got any news you want to bring up? Well, uh, no, not really. I saw some new shots for the uh, Sin City new movie. That looks like it's going to be quite, quite good. Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that's about as far as it goes. As far as trailers go, like I said, I only watched really the Guardians of the Galaxy trailer, and that looks like it's going to be a pretty fun, good movie coming out. Yeah, yeah. It could go either way, but you know, fingers crossed, it doesn't go the bad way. So I, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't see it going the bad way. A hundred percent, Guardians of the Galaxy is going to fucking rock beyond belief because they've taken. Which they they taken a property, a comic book series, a bunch of characters who no one's ever heard of, realistically outside of like the real inner comic community, and they're I mean, what I'm seeing from this film. Fucking hell, this is going to blow my fucking tits off. Mm. Yeah, it should be good. Yeah, <clears throat> Steve, what what trailers have you seen this week? Oh, trailers I've seen this week. Well, yeah. um, do trailers. Well, I saw a trailer for Premature. It's already out now, and basically it's like Groundhog Day, but instead of, like, dying and waking up the next day, all you have to do is orgasm and you wake up and back in the same day. <laughs> so, so it's like Edge of Tomorrow, edging for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, if you take the concept from Groundhog Day, Mystery Spot, Edge of Tomorrow, but change it to a teenage boy at high school... And every time he comes, he wakes up, <laughs> he wakes up, repeating the same day over and over. Does it have a heat of the moment on the radio? Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't. But uh, if, if, you, if you watch the trailer, they have really played this premise out to the most hilarious effect they could get from it. So it's so cringeworthy to the point where he's actually running away from bullies and to get out of being beaten up, he drops his pants and starts jacking off <laughs> in one of the classrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and the bullies run in and like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and he's just like, oh, come. And then back and <laughs> avoids <laughs> so, oh, oh, He's got to be watching that after. This is uh, it's, it's, it's it's an independent film. It's like a Sundance kind of festival, a uh, kind of comedy. Um, it's got uh, what's it? Alan Tide Tudek Tudek 
Too dick. Yeah, from a Firefly, and it just looks the perfect way to give another take on the whole repeating the same day over and over again kind of concept. <laughs> it absolutely fucking it had me absolutely cracking up. I mean, just it's if you don't like cringeworthy comedy, avoid it like the plague. If you love awkward situations that, and you especially if you have ever been or are a teenage boy, you've got to see this. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, um, what I, I've not really trailers, but I mean, um, the obviously the World Cup has been on and fucking ITV. What was the game yesterday? Argentina, Holland. But yeah. just advertising the fuck out of um, Rise of the is it the uh, Revenge what? of the Rise of Beneath the Planet of the Apes or whatever. <laughs> 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 it's got such a long name, I rem- no, can't it's remember. Not. What is it? No, what is it? It's, how, not, how, it's not Rise of the Planet of the Apes. That was the first one. It's the dawn of the rise of the. See, no <laughs> one can remember. <laughs> Dude, seriously, what was your title again? Dawn of the Planet of the. Apes. No, mine was uh, <laughs> the rise. The rise. <laughs> the rise of beneath the planet. Yeah. <laughs> that is like every title from the original exactly, Charles Essen run rolled into one. It's just Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. It's just too much for a title. Well, not really, because yeah, you know, it's, it's Planet of the Apes. So already you have four words that have to be included in the mm. title, and it is a, because you had Escape from the Planet of the Apes, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, uh, ben, uh Beneath the Planet of the Apes and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's not a ba- it's not a terrible title. It looks like a fucking amazing film as well. Mm, yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. It just looks, it looks so good. Couldn't they just call it Dawn of the Apes? DPS two. Because it's not like you're going to get it mixed up with any other movies, is it? It's not oh. like you look at it and go, oh, it's a new Terminator movie. Couldn't they have just called it the Planet of the Apes to fuck up Steve's DVD collection? <laughs> You can't, you can't call it um, anything other. You have to have Planet of the Apes involved because that is the main marketable title in this entire franchise. I mean, this franchise now is what uh, was it? Four or five films originally, animated series, and Not then Mark. no, no, no. I was about to say, and then that really good one-ish one with like James Franco and that. And we don't count that Tim Burton film. We don't count that. Mm. It exists. It doesn't exist. It right. only exists if you believe it exists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm on the planet of the apes. <laughs> oh no, I'm on the planet of the apes. Uh, Marky Mark, and I talk like this. Everything sounds like a question. Did you know the, uh, <laughs> the Simpsons episode where they rip it off and it's the, the musical of the planet of the apes? Oh, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas. <laughs> Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, one last trailer quick was um, Earth to Echo. Mm. It actually looks amazing. Do you remember when like uh, Jumanji came out? That was like a really great family kids film that kind of had modern special effects and kind of connected back to like more eighties style kind of kids films. Yeah, with characters and um, sort of story, the way it kind of flowed. Well, Earth to Echo. There's none of that. <laughs> no, no, Earth to Echo looks like. If you take like the digital generation, what they are now, we were like the analog generation. We had eight, we were eight bit. We had sixteen bit, you know, home computers, microcomputers, uh, VCR, v, you know, VHS tapes, that kind of stuff. Well, now with iPads and um, smartphones, this kind of looks like a film that's not cashing in, like uh, a piss poor Aliens in the Attic or some kind of shit like that. This is this looks like a really good kids film. Looks that is it found take, footage style. It's, it's found footage style. style, yeah. It's all because basically, it's like if you take the Goonies, the Explorers, E.T. and Mac and Me. No, I shouldn't have said <laughs> Mac and Me there, but uh, if you take like the Goonies, the Explorers, E.T., Flight and Navigator, all kind of that, and base it around the concept that this whole found footage is based on these kids' smartphones receiving sort of transmissions from outer space, and they find this little alien. Uh, it, it, honestly, it looks so fucking good. This on it, this seriously could be the best kind of kids' film. 80s kind of kids film like for the modern audience it you know how um jj abrams tried to recreate that spielberg kids kind of experience with eight uh i was gonna say eight, right. i was gonna say eight millimeter oh, jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> no wonder, a bit of a wrong reference you know, to isn't it no yeah. Kids film, um yeah with super eight this looks like it's going to be the genuine version no kind of like 
nostalgia, just an actual full on bang. This 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 the kids are gonna love this. I didn't mind Super Eight. It was all right. The thing, it, I had the same problem with a lot of films that get nowadays when you when you talk to people about them or look online, when people hype them up so much that when you finally see them, you know, you, you can't help but build your expectations up and you're let down. Look, that's just because you were let down Didn't by you? Because everyone was like, it's, it's like a new Goonies. It's like the Goonies. It's, oh, it's this generation's Goonies. And I was like, it was nothing like the fucking Goonies. No. How dare you? What, like how every single fucking sci-fi film has on the poster the new Star Wars? Yeah. <laughs> well, like, makes Jurassic Park look crap. Like, Congo had something like that, weren't it? It was like, make Jurassic Park fucking... Who? Like, child fight. I don't think it was Congo, actually. I'm getting it uh, wrong because um, it was a Michael Crichton film. But there was a film. I'll find out for next show. What? Oh, was it Was it uh, Deep Rising? It might have been. So was like big stress <clears throat> apart that like shit or something. I, I, I only I that might have, that might have been one of the one of the taglines for Deep Rising actually. Mm, Which is a really good film. I really enjoy that. The last trailer I watched, I don't want to bring that no, it wasn't Deep Rising. It might have been like Anaconda or something. Now the last um trailer that I watched, I don't want to go into it too much because it might put Loz into a uh, a forty five minute tangent again, is um <laughs> Uh, the Maze Runners, which is, um, I didn't know, but he said straight away when we talked about it before that it's, it's based on a book and it's for that, um, the I am number four slash Hunger Games slash Twilight audience. And it just, soon as, soon as the trailer comes on, it just reeks of it, doesn't it? Just, yeah. you can smell the, <laughs> what, you call it? what did you say, the froth? <laughs> yeah. You can smell the froth coming out of. <laughs> it, it it does look absolutely awful. Uh, parts of it actually remind me like a, it's like a I don't know this guy has that teen horribleness to it. This like new like you say the Twilight and the Host and Hunger Games take on like like do you remember the film ninety four film No Escape? Oh, fucking hell. rings a bell. Ray Liotta. No, yeah, it does, yeah it rings a bell. Uh, Ernie Hudson is. It seems to be that these kind of like teen films are. I mean, it's the new, it's the new sort of like template, isn't it? It's like a new genre. But whereas, I think, in the nineteen eighties, you had muscle men action <clears throat> films that were like, you know, every every action film was a muscle man action film. Now, like, it seems every film is just this, you know, sparkly vampire douchebag. Mm. I'm not going to talk about this because I was old Brent. I've got <laughs> strong opinions on this. Do it. Especially, no, especially, especially the whole book to film franchise. Right, you've got, we're going to give you a minute to talk about it and starting from no, now. I can't. I go, can't. I won't go. be. I won't be able to. Go. Shit. Go. Pip, shit pip, 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 pip. It absolutely shits me to tears because oh, it pip. seems like people can't make their own movies anymore so they turn to 40 year old women who have no life and decide they want to relive their life through a book like Twilight and then they post it out and then all these people read it and think it's the most amazing thing and then they make it into a movie and okay the book may have been okay and then the movie is just wank and they just grab all these shit actors that no one knows stick them in a movie and expect girls to just froth over it because it's got that title of the book and then all it is is to sell fucking shit. My wife used to work in a game shop. When Twilight came out, the whole shop was just ruled with shit from Twilight that you don't need. A necklace with Edward's symbol on it. <laughs> Sorry, we, have, gonna... we should all get together and write a book and call it The Froth. Where it's like a bunch of teenagers um, get mystical powers or something. <laughs> oh, no, we could actually make a film like, it's called The Froth, but it's more like, you know, The Stuff or The Blob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> That'd be a good thing, you know, like the scene of it coming out of the cinema and you could have, like, now showing, like, uh, Twilight. <laughs> the thing, thing is, like, with, with a lot of these books, they start off quite good. Like, my wife read a few. She's read Hunger Games and this one. Maze Runner, and she said it starts off alright, but she said the ending, it's like they haven't thought it through, they just sort of go, okay, how are we going to end it? Uh, yeah, that'll do. So they can make endless sequels. No, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah, I will have to argue back, because you can't just criticise it for that, because you have to go back and look at the past. 
to really because if See, you're going on a fucking tangent again over no, the whole of the film. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you ha- you can't just go, oh, this film's new, it fits into this genre, and it's shit because blah, 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 the ending, blah, blah, blah. Stephen shit King... Shit because is, it looks shit, that's yeah, why. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah, because Stephen King's one of the greatest authors of all time, but he can't fucking end a book to save his fucking life. It's just like, oh, tension, tension, amazing, these kids, kids in the corn, kids in the corn, kids in the... Oh, fuck, it's an alien. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, it's a clown, it's a clown, it's a clown. Oh my god, it's scary shit, it's scary shit. Tim Curry, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Fuck it, it's an alien. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it, they should have ended it before it got to the um, the part where they're adults. That's for the movie I'm talking about. Well, they definitely, he, he definitely should end the story before he gets to the whole sort of death lights and that kind of... I mean, okay, I know they had trouble trying to bring his kind of novel to the, the you know, the screen and how to depict it and that kind of shit. But still, Stephen King still can't end. He can't end a book. He makes a pin pass movie though. What like Maximum fuck? Overdrive? <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. Well, like Maximum fucking Overdrive. Yeah, whatever. Fuck off. That's awesome. But you got to remember as well because like Running Man, that was based on a book. Tyreek, oh, the that, Running that's based Man on is a book. such a good book, <laughs> but the film is just. I know it's like eighties classic in inverted commas, but it is a shit film. The book the is such a brilliant it. book. But anyway, um, let's, let's, let's move on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's trailers. Um, right, let's go around the table. I'm going to skip this one because I haven't watched anything new this week. I just oh. rewatched uh, Ferris Bueller and obviously Transformers. But I've also rewatched um because I was watching them with my kids, is um, the Indiana Jones films, the first three. I mean, fucking hell, them films are so good. That's yeah. classics. Yeah, exactly. They, they're just... <clears throat> the thing as well is that, they're obviously, because they're set in, you know, they just don't look aged because... They're period know, they're, pieces. Yeah, period pieces. They're just so good. And we had the discussion the other day, weren't we? Well, I don't know why Temple of Doom gets such a bad rap. You know, I, I think, as we were saying, wasn't it? it was just stupid fucking internet bloggers who just want to be like, oh, the Temple of Doom, what on earth good... Well, I remember as a kid, I saw Temple of Doom, I think I saw it first, actually, on TV, mm. and I loved it. I mean, the minecart, uh, the bridge ending scene, it is, uh, it is brilliant. And yes, okay, I, I understand all the criticism levied at Temple of Doom for the endless screaming and the like, and how they shoehorned in short round. And it, Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there that That's you can like, nitpick. But yeah, he's brilliant. Dr. Jones, no time for love, Dr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because, I mean, although the uh, Raiders had its, um, like, comedic moments in it, but, you know, it was quite a serious film, you know, like with the, 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 the Nazi undertones and things like that, but Temple of Doom was a lot more fun, if you will, you know. It was more of a roller coaster, and I think people just thought, oh, it's not like the original, so I'll slag it off. Which the thing is, which is funny because it, when it was released, everyone loved it because we hadn't become so cynical with these more over the top sort of sequels that we now come <clears> to <throat> expect. Like, you know, when you have a, like one film that starts off like The Matrix and then you get to The Matrix Reloaded, which I actually do fucking love, but it goes more over the top. Yeah, this did. And it went over the top. And some people now argue it went over the top in the wrong ways, but I think it's still solid. Yeah, okay. Kate Capshaw's fucking. <laughs> All that kind of crap. You know? <laughs> That's fine. But come on, watching that as a kid, where he fucking bails out of a plane and uses a fucking inflatable dinghy. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. And so yeah, it's I still, still not as bad. It. It's still not as bad as the Crystal Skull. Yeah, I know. We I haven't about... got to that one yet. I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I'm gonna give it another chance. Uh, exactly. I was about to them. say. I, I can accept that Indian Jones can jump out of a fucking plane on an inflatable <laughs> life raft, but I can't accept the fridge scene. <laughs> no, no. Right, um, As Alan Ruck is about to say in the interview, coming up in a few minutes, suspension of disbelief. Uh-huh. <laughs> Loz, what have, you been, have you watched anything new this week? I have, actually. I watched The Impossible, which is the um, tsunami film about the tsunami that hit um, Thailand? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, uh, it's not nice saying it's a great film, like, but it's a, it's a touching film. Yeah, it's, it is. Like, um, I never knew it was a Spanish film, to be honest. I thought it was a big American thing, but it's actually made in Spain. Mm. Um, and then it went to the 
uh, Toronto Film Festival, and then it sort of got released after that. But I remember watching it, and it was just full on. And it's it's not like it doesn't focus on the white family who go travelling. They're just there for like the story. But when you see it, you see like all the locals who have lost everything, and they mm. wave through the crap and just pull out whoever they can. It doesn't matter who it is, and they just help them out. Well, that's the it's thing a, that's that's, be- that's good about it. Is, well, not good, but like that it shows you you know like you always see tsunamis on the news and that and it's just a water washing through you don't see what's happening under that water do you and when when no. it fucking hits and it's showing her you know she's getting beaten the fuck up you know she's getting like impaled <sighs> on the stuff and everything under the water yeah it's, and it's that's true. what kills people yeah, it's, I mean, it's true. When you see, like, news footage of, like, things like tsunamis, it doesn't, I don't know, it just, it doesn't ever come across as dangerous. It kind of looks very calm. It's just mm. that it's sheer pressure. And as you said, you don't see what's under the surface. You know, it's it's not bade. You know, it's not, you know, a, a disaster on the news hasn't got, like, fireworks going off and it's, you know, not got Aerosmith on the soundtrack to make it seem more impressive than it is. It's just terrifying. And I do like yeah. the idea of a film that doesn't have to focus on a cliched bunch of people to try and put you in the, in, in the uh, kind of perspective of the disaster. It's just actually a mm. movie about the disaster. Mm. And it's very well done. Um, Hugh McGregor is one of my favourite actors anyway. Yeah, definitely. So I've got a bit of a, bit of a boner over that. But <laughs> it's, yeah, solid. Solid movie worth we'll a watch. <laughs> solid movie, solid cock. <laughs> I just realised. I realised. I just said solid cock about a movie where thousands of people die. So <laughs> let's uh, let's move on swiftly before. So yeah, sorry. I, I didn't realise you were Michael Bay for a second there. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, anything new? Yes, lots of things. Yeah, well, there's loads of stuff. I mean, I've just been watching films non-stop. I mean, I saw obviously. What I've been massively focused on to a point where actually I'm obsessed is Transformers Age of Extinction. Right. And now... <laughs> Don't spoil it because... I'm I've now it. slagged off Michael Bay several times, but, <laughs> I have po- but I've made a video and I've also posted a blog um, article all about why Transformers Age of Extinction is actually the most perfect Transformers film in the entire franchise. Okay. It's simple. It's a stereotype of a blockbuster aimed to a new audience. If they're not aiming at um, like the tr- traditional markets, they're looking at China, and because China have actually already pumped in about two hundred twenty million into the box office, and America has only actually sort of done about one hundred eighty or something million. So China's a lot of fucking people. They, it's a product place to to promote brand equity and to basically put, and get bums on seats in the cinema. It's a fucking massive, massive market now. And this film is a stereotype of a blockbuster. It's, it's over the top. The action's massive. And it basically does... Well, I mean, check out the argument. But to sum it up, it does exactly what Transformers was supposed to do from 1984 onwards. Sell shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, said, I said to you, didn't I... Um... Obviously, because Dark of the Moon had more, but um, I see a thing, because obviously I'll be bringing it up later, but Transformers Rise of the Re- Revenge of the Fallen um, broke the record for most product placements in a movie, yeah. but then yeah, Dark, think... of the Dark Side of the Moon broke that, and I'm probably... Dark, so dark Side of the Moon. Dark of the Moon. <laughs> dark of the Moon. I'm tired. <laughs> the, the, yeah, and I'm probably going to assume that the new one broke that record as well. Well, yeah, I think it was uh, Revenge of the Fallen had 71 clearly visible in your face. Well, no, sorry. Revenge of the Fallen had 71 clearly identical products placed within the film or brands. Uh, Dark of the Moon, I believe, had 76 clearly visible and kind of placed, whereas Age of Extinction has God knows how many brands to the point where certain scenes are micro advertisements for these brands. Mm -hmm. Mark Wahlberg picks up a Bud Light, cracks it open, drinks it and throws it down in one little one little segment scene. Um, (laughs) There's things up the Pepsi. It's a taste of a new generation. Pretty much, no, <laughs> it is. There are, you know, whereas before, yeah, okay, the guy's holding an Xbox in the first one and it turns into a Transformer. And there's the Mountain Dew vending machine that turns into a Transformer. That's very in your face. But 
not with actors standing there, holding the beer up, pausing for a second, going, ah, oh, that's the taste of America. That's the taste of freedom. <laughs> Yeah, but what you were saying about the first ones, you know, like the the vending machine and things like that and the Xbox, that's that's the point of the film though, isn't it? Machines and robots. Yeah, I mean okay. I mean if know. if it happened in this living room, you know, my Xbox, my PlayStation, my Samsung T V you know, would all change, you know. Exactly. You I mean you can't that's... not product place these items. Yeah, if you want to ground a film in the like real universe like the real world universe we live in now you you have to accept there's going to be some product placement because i drive down the street and i see 30 lorry you know people are like kicking off about spider-man sort of swinging past a colesberg truck uh i drive past trucks with brand logos on the side of them every day i go into my kitchen and if you film me right now there's no product placement it's just <laughs> actually i've just i buy there are brands that i've purchased and they are in the background well, i've got two bottles of Bud light sitting in front of me oh yeah Oops. you know <laughs> And no one, no one ever sort of kicks up a fuss and sort of, and had a go at like uh, in Superman two when Superman gets thrown into a Marlboro truck or when he throws Zod um, into a Coca Cola sign. It's just the or way. Or Mac and Me where he has the kids party. <laughs> now that is when no Mac and Me was the turning point when people did start to kick off about <laughs> product placement because that was when a film was no longer. Um, set in the real world with products behind it, it was basically promoting products as one giant cinematic commercial. And this is what Age of Extinction is. Mm. When Stanley Tucci, in a one scene, he's on a rooftop waiting for rescue, and he's sitting there, and for no reason whatsoever, he goes to a, a, a refrigerator that is on this rooftop for no reason, opens it, and takes out a well-known oh, Chinese <laughs> brand. No, no, it's a well-known Chinese brand of milk. This is what I'm saying. It's crafted for China. They've, they're deliberately doing a lot of product placement to tap into the Chinese market as well as sell American brands across mm. there. And he picks up this carton of milk and he sits there, puts a straw in, and starts drinking it for a good 20-odd seconds. And now 20 seconds doesn't sound a long time, but in the course of an action film, he's <laughs> sitting there drinking it, and then as his spaceship rises behind him, he kind of like goes, oh, oh, as he looks around and draws a straw out. And it, it's just the whole shot is not focused on the million dollar special effects in the background. The bloody million dollar actor sitting in the chair. It's focused on this carton of milk, which he doesn't even hold like a normal person. You, when you hold something, you wrap your hand around it, don't you? Mm. You know, so your the back of your hand faces. If I was filming myself right now uh, with a can in my hand, the back of my hand faces the camera. No, this carton of milk is basically held in the exact same way people drink cans of Pepsi and Coca Cola and RC Cola in commercials. So you can see the logo. <laughs> Rent over. <laughs> yes. Right, so you watch that. Um, I'm just gonna go and uh, I'm just gonna go and enjoy my Bud Light, the beer for podcasters around the world. Good, good, good. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So I think um, now will be a good time to include uh, the interview with Alan Ruck, who you may know from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Speed, Twister, Spin City. Uh, as, as well as a load of other stuff so uh, Alan Ruck everyone so joining us on uh, this episode we have the legend that is Alan Ruck so thanks for joining oh us Alan <laughs> it's quite um, I don't know that's a lot to live up to but hi <laughs> uh, you are a legend don't be so uh, modest so um, uh, I mean what we're going to do we're just going to go sort of round the table I mean I know you know we're all fans of your work anyway so you know we'll just uh uh, shoot some questions and that and just have a chat and um so i mean what what would probably be the best one to start off with was uh i mean what what made you get into acting in the first place oh you know i uh uh, uh when i was a kid i i was not um i was not a good athlete and uh i was a, a good student until puberty hit and then i just couldn't concentrate on anything <laughs> and uh i didn't uh, i didn't sort of you know i wasn't one of the cool kids i didn't have some sort of thing that gave me an identity uh, you know uh how kids um, define themselves by what they do i didn't have any of that and my older sister had been in plays before me and i'd watched her do it and i always thought that i that's something that i could do 
and then when I got to high school, I just uh, I wound up auditioning for a play, and uh, I got in, and uh, the feedback was good. And then uh, in my high school, uh, they actually had a drama program where, through the English department where you could take acting classes and play production classes. So I just started to load up my schedule with that kind of stuff. And um, pretty much from the time I was 15 on, I was like, oh, this is who I am. And it just, you know, it gave me, it was something I was good at, and it made me feel good about myself, and that's that's why I got into it. Awesome, awesome. I mean, uh, Steve, you got anything you want to... Well, yeah, obviously, a massive fan of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and obviously you were friends with Matthew Broderick, and you did the Broadway production, am I right, of Biloxi Blues at the time, before the film? That's right. Yeah, we had, um, we were, uh, we were in the middle of that, we were in New York, we had opened, and... The play was a big success, and they had offered Matthew, Hughes had offered Matthew uh, the role of Ferris, and um, then um, my agent tried to get me an audition, and they said, oh, he's too old, he's too old, which was really true. But then my agent said, well, you know, he plays opposite Matthew every night, and they, they're both supposed to be teenagers, so you might want to rethink that. So then they... They agreed to see me, and the thing was that I knew John a bit because I had auditioned for The Breakfast Club some years before in Chicago. John had written The Breakfast Club before Sixteen Candles, and he was going to just do it as kind of a an indie, low-budget Chicago movie. And then he met Molly Ringwald, and the, the legend goes that he wrote Sixteen Candles for her in a weekend and then put... Uh, the Breakfast Club on the back burner for a while. So I knew John a little bit, and uh, so anyway, I auditioned for the casting people, and I auditioned for John, and then they finally gave it to me after they couldn't find anybody bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, it works out for the best. I mean, when did it actually dawn on you that you had actually made the film that kind of defined a generation? Well, you know, I'm just really happy that people still enjoy it, and I, uh, I think... Uh, any anything about that movie, I mean, obviously we had fun doing it, and I think we all did a good job, but I think uh, any credit in terms of that goes to John Hughes because he was the one that really had his finger on the pulse of youth in America, and uh, he, was, he was sort of their um, staunch advocate. You know, he, uh, he was, uh, he believed in kids, and he didn't try to belittle their problems or their concerns or their worries. He uh, he gave them, uh, he honored all that stuff. So uh, any, you know, the success of that movie is all because of John Hughes. Yeah, I mean, he's a legend. So. Yeah, I mean, from from that film, you must be one of the most quoted actors of all time. I mean, if you had ten cents every time someone said "swing, batter, 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 swing," you'd be a you'd be able to buy Bill Gates, surely. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, um basically mate, like um you've done a lot of T V work. I was just wondering what what show you really felt at home with. What one did you think was the you know, best one to work with? I had so much fun on Spin City. Um uh Michael J. Fox sort of uh picked his playmates because we auditioned for uh, Gary David Goldberg, the late Gary David Goldberg, and for, uh, Bill Lawrence, who had created the show. And then, uh, Michael had final casting approval. So I was living in Los Angeles, and, uh, I flew to New York, uh, to audition, uh, for Michael. And, um, uh, just, you know, happily, luckily, that went my way. And, um, I had been friends and had worked before with Michael Boatman on a show that only lasts 13 episodes, and we were dead last in the ratings every week. It was called Muscle, and it was the old WB network. But Boatman and I had been paired up on that, and then um, I was flying back to Los Angeles from, you know, the audition with Michael, and uh, I talked to my manager, and she said, well, honey, you got the part. And, um, you know, I was thrilled, and she said, and I didn't want to tell you until now, but Michael Boatman has already been cast. Because I didn't want to jinx it for you, you know. So that was just. So I was already friends with Boatman, and then um, I met Barry Boswick on that show, and we we've become friends for life. 
Um, I'm friends with all those guys, with uh, Richard Kind and Sandy Chaplin. Um, we've we've all stayed in contact, and I think it's because we all share a really uh, uh, twisted sense of humor. And I think that's all because of Fox, because Fox picked people that sort of shared his, you know, twisted view of the world, and we had an awful lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you said Spin City, because... I used to love it as a kid, and the chemistry that you guys have is just incredible. You know, it's such a well-crafted show. I mean, I love it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I don't think there was a Saturday morning in the UK where it wasn't on TV, so growing <laughs> up in the 90s. Uh. Um, um, but, uh, good. You had, um, had a bit of a stint in the, uh, the mid-90s in some action films, uh, Speed and Twister. Obviously, uh, with um, director Jan de Bont, did he sort of ask you to come back for Twister after Speed? Yeah, that was uh, that was um, that was happy. Um, I uh, I got the job in Speed, and that was another film that was that was another job that was just a pleasure from start to finish. They had um, the Department of Transportation had completed the 105 freeway. Yeah. in Los Angeles, but it was not yet open to the public. So then uh, 20th Century Fox made some deal with the Department of Transportation, and we got to use the 105 freeway as our location, as our back lot, for I think it was four or six weeks. It was quite a long time, but we had, it was ours, you know. There was nobody else on it. And um, so that was exciting. And, uh, it was very innovative. They kept coming up with new ways to, um, uh, do the camera work on that show. They had, uh, I think maybe it was at least half a dozen buses, uh, mm-hmm. different buses that we used. And some of them, one of them was called the Pokemobile because it had this huge plexiglass unit, uh, attached to the front of the, uh, the front of the, the vehicle. So, um, the, the driver actually sat on the roof and, um, uh, you know, Sandy Bullock just had a, a dummy steering wheel, didn't do anything. And, um, that way they had all those great close-ups of Keanu and, and, and Sandy and Hawthorne James, who was the bus driver who got shot and all that stuff. You know, they had all those great close-ups up front. They also rigged this thing and made a, uh, invented a little dolly that ran on the, the handrail, uh, they turned the handrail, you know, up above the seats uh, into a dolly track. They uh-huh. eliminated the top bracket and reinforced the bottom bracket, and they created a dolly. They, uh, you know, fabricated a dolly, and they hung the camera with bungee cords uh, off that dolly, and that way they could be up at the front of the bus and then go, you know, screaming around and uh, uh, go all the way to the back of the bus and twist that camera every which way and grab whatever they could of all of us on the bus. So it was really interesting to see all the innovation and all the uh, creativity going on. A lot of fun. Yeah. Did you audition for it, or did um, was you called up for it? No, that one I auditioned for. I mean, the, the truth is, um, uh, the people that just get offered things tend to be stars, and pretty much everybody else has to audition. Um, I, uh, I get offered episodes of... Um, uh, television shows, just like, would you like to come in and do this guest spot or whatever? But when it comes to being a series regular or playing any, uh, sizable part in a film, uh, you, most people have to audition. So yeah, I auditioned for that. And, um, the, the Twister one, I think, as I recall, uh, Jan might have just called me up about that. All right. But, um, yeah, I mean, he was, he was very sweet. He just decided he wanted me to be part of that movie. Oh. Um, yeah, that one was not as much fun. That one was not as much fun as, um, Speed. It was, it was hard. We were out in the boondocks. We were in Oklahoma and Iowa in the middle of nowhere. For, for part of it in Iowa, we were actually on a pig farm for quite a while. And, um, you can just imagine what that smells like in the summer. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, it's not always, it's not always so glamorous, you know. Um, you suppose it's just, uh, I mean, how, how long did the shoot go on for? I, I assume a couple of months at least. The, uh, Twister? Yeah. 
That one, that one was very long. I think it was four months. We started in April. Let's see, April, May, June, July. Yeah, it was four months, maybe four months and a little bit. And so it was four yeah. months of getting beaten up by fans and stuff like that and fake rain. Oh, yeah, they, they, <laughs> they actually had a jet engine. They, you know, that was, I don't know, taken off some plane, but they had a jet engine mounted on a truck that, you know, just created incredible wind, you know, crea- that, that incredible exhaust. And then they would, like, throw pieces of styrofoam, you know, made to look like rocks, you know, up into the stream of air, and that would be blown, you know, in our direction. Isn't that fun? They had a machine that um, took huge slabs of ice, like you would get from an ice house. Right. And the ice slid down a chute, and at the bottom of the chute was a V8 engine that was attached to a giant chopper blade. (laughs) And then, so the ice slid down the chute, got chopped up, and then was shot through a, a funnel, through a chute, up into the air uh, to simulate hail. <laughs> so, but the thing was that it moved really, really rapidly. I mean, I think big hail hurts anyway. But, I mean, there were pieces, there were like, there were really like small ice cubes pelting down on us, you know. And if you catch one of those on the top of your head, it kind of <laughs> wants, you kind of drop to your knees. I mean, it's, it's not pleasant. You know, I mean, we would get, they would hit us on the back, like the shoulder blades, point of our shoulders, you know, that, that stuff really hurts. So that was not really a fun shoot, you know, I mean, it made a lot of money and I guess, uh, you know, everybody considered it a success, but there have been easier jobs in my life. <laughs> so, so I guess, yeah, the, the whole actual set and shoot gave you the kind of sense of dread <laughs> as if you were actually facing a tornado from the punishment you were going through. Well, that, that part was good. There were other times when, you know, we would be staring at a clear, blue, beautiful sky in Oklahoma in June, and Jan DePont would be yelling at us, it's the biggest tornado you've ever seen, you're going to die, you guys, you're not scared enough, you know, <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, because it was all CGI, it was all uh, put in later, and, um, you know, at the time, you feel like an idiot, because you feel like you're just, like, mugging and making huge faces, and, uh, you know, you just feel like an idiot, and then when you actually see the film, you're like, oh, I could have been bigger. I could, have, I could have been much more scared. I could have been like, you know, wetting my pants, and it would have been appropriate. Yeah. yeah. So you, so you didn't ask you back to do Speed Two, then? No? They actually, uh, uh, Jan did uh, uh, offer me a little part in that, um, just because he thought it would be funny to have that that poor guy who was stuck on the bus all of a sudden be stuck on a a boat. You know, just he thought that would be funny. But I had just been, um, I just uh, was cast in Spin City. Oh, yeah. And it yeah. looked like I had to go to New York to start work on Spin City. And it, the, the shoot dates conflicted. There was no way I could do it. So, A, a good career yeah. choice there. Yeah. Yeah, no, it worked out just fine, yeah. <laughs> Steve? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to actually ask, um, were you a Star Trek fan before Star Trek Generations? Because you did that fan <clears throat> film of Gods and Men as well a few years ago. Uh, I'm sorry, repeat that last bit. Oh, sorry. Um, were you a Star Trek fan before you obviously were the captain of the Starship Enterprise in Star Trek Generations? <clears throat> as you did a um, fan film, uh, Gods of Men, a few years back? Yeah, yeah, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm old enough that I was uh, a boy when the original series came out, I mean, I think, I think I was 10 years old when that, the series, uh, uh, debuted, and so I was crazy about it, you know, uh, for the couple of years that was, it was on TV, and, uh, then I didn't think too much more about it, and I went off to college, and my first college roommate was an aeronautical engineer who was a self-described Trekkie, and I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know that that stuff existed, but even in the 70s, there was already a, a huge following, and Gene Roddenberry actually uh, would travel around to universities and, you know, give lectures and, uh, you know, obviously for, for a great deal of money. Uh, uh, he would put on these performances or these, these shows, and um, all, the, all the sci-fi geeks, you know, came out in droves. So I, I knew that, that that stuff existed, but I didn't think too much about it, and 
the next generation came along. I watched some of it and I enjoyed it. And then uh, I got a chance to audition for that part. And when the, the audition came in, I said, who do they want me to audition for? And he said, Harriman. Because I thought they were going to cast me as like some, you know, alien with a broccoli <laughs> head or something, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, uh, you know, they said, no, it's this, this captain. And, you know, I mean, uh, I feel good about myself, but I've never, I've never really sort of uh, pictured myself as a starship commander. That's not, I don't wake up in the morning and shave and look in the mirror and say, wow, this is a starship commander. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, as it turned out, the guy was, he was uh, a guy who was in way, in way over his head, and he was. I, I made up sort of a backstory for myself that uh, the way I must have landed that job was through political connections. Maybe I had an influential family who were trying to help me build a career. But uh, uh, it was it was interesting, you know, because I got to meet Walter Koenig, who I'm, I'm, I've seen a number of times over the years at uh, conventions and so forth, and. Uh, Got to meet Shatner, you know, and he's exactly what you'd expect. And uh, uh, I got to meet um, James Doohan, you know, and he was a he was a peach of a guy. He was a wonderful fella. So it was, um, you know, I mean, those guys had been my boyhood heroes for a while, and then uh, years later, I played this guy who had idolized these uh, characters, you know, in the Star Trek world. Uh, as his boyhood hero, so it was that was a pretty easy fit. <laughs> yeah, so it kind of like fits into what kind of how we're doing this interview right now. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Those? Very, very um, so I'm just wondering what's what's happening now. What you currently working on? Where you're going? Well, I'm uh, actually uh, I'm married to um, an actress named Mirei Enos, who's um, doing very, very well right now. And um, uh, four years ago, we have a, a, a little girl who's almost uh, four. She's she's going to be four years old in a couple of months. And um, when my wife uh, became pregnant with Vesper, um, that's when her career just took off like a rocket. It's like the baby and her career showed up at the same time. And so she, um, she was the lead on... Um, the Killing, that was that played on um, AMC and now is on Netflix. And yeah, actually, she yeah. just finished up the last six episodes. They, uh, on a, I think August 1st, they're going to start um, making the last six uh, episodes available on Netflix. Um, so she she did that show. Uh, she did the pilot when she was uh, four months pregnant. And then when Vesper was seven weeks old, we drove to Canada and she started working on the show. And right after that, she went, we went to England because, uh, Mireille was in Woodless, we with Brad Pitt. And then she's just been really working really hard, you know, quite a lot for the past four years. So I've mostly been Mr. Mom. I do episodes of this, that, and the other thing, you know. Uh, there's a show on, uh, ABC called The Whispers. Okay. That, uh, is, uh, I think it's going to be a mid-season replacement. And so I have a recurring part on that and I'm supposed to go up uh, to Vancouver and do a couple episodes of that in the next couple months uh, but I do voiceovers for Volkswagen and I just kind of I'm uh, flying under the radar right now well there's and a I... there's a film coming out. I mean we've I've been seeing the poster on online for ages but obviously it's still um, not been released or booted yeah, I did that quite a while ago. Yeah. I, I, I think I did that, oh, I mean, I think it'll be five years ago this coming fall, because I, I did it before, I did it before, um, when you got pregnant with Vesper. And, uh, yeah, so I think it'll be like five years ago this coming October or something that, uh, I did that. And, um, it was a very funny, uh, script, a very funny idea. And some young guys in Philadelphia had put this together, and they, they found the money to, to put this production together. And um, the funny part, you know, and they paid me a little bit, so I, I went to Philadelphia and I did it. And then I think what happened was it was um, there's been uh, 
a conflict between the director and uh, the producers as to um, some editing, perhaps, like some direction they wanted the film to go and maybe somebody didn't agree, and so it's been sort of tied up legally uh, for quite a while. So I don't know. They say it's going to be released soon, but I, I don't know. We'll see. I hope so, because it does look pretty funny, so... Yeah, it was, it was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Steve, Loz, you got anything else you want to add? Or? Well, yeah, I just no, wanted I'm to know. Good. I just, well, sorry, I, I just wanted to know actually. Um, who is your favourite actor? Oh man, this, you know what? The list is endless. I mean, it, it it changes. It changes. I mean, it doesn't really change. It just gets added to. Mm. Um. You know, maybe on a weekly basis, because I'll see somebody do something, and I'll, I'll just think, well, there's nobody else that could have done that better, you know. Uh, I've always been a big fan of Gary Oldman. Oh. Um, we're about the same age, and then, you know, when I saw that guy, first thing I ever saw him do, I think, was um, prick up your ears. And uh, I thought, who, who the hell is this? Because, man, is he good, you know. Um, always been a big fan of him. I'm very impressed with Matthew McConaughey lately. Yeah. Uh, that guy, I mean, this just makes, you know, I, I uh, to be honest, I never thought that much of him. I thought, oh, he's a good looking guy and, you know, he's, uh, really affable and everybody seems to like him. He's a very likable guy. But I, you know, I, I, I never, I never, never thought of him as a great actor and then holy smokes, he, that Dallas Buyers Club and now just True Detective. Yeah. And that guy, I just think it, it just goes to show you should never underestimate anyone, you know, uh, because, you know, that guy's as good as anybody out there. Terrific work. Yeah. Um, Helen Mirren, very crazy about her. Brian Cranston. Yeah. That guy's yeah definitely. Amazing. You know, I mean, just, it's, it's endless. It's endless. Uh, if you probably just started, you know, rattling off some names, I would probably say, oh, yeah, I love them. <laughs> yeah, it's just really interesting because yeah. obviously you can watch a film and sort of, you know, analyze someone's <clears throat> performance in a way that obviously maybe we can't because obviously that's what you do for a profession. Well, I think what, what happens is um, there's this thing that as an audience member, that we all hopefully experience and it's called the suspension of disbelief and that, you know, at some point in the story, hopefully from the very beginning, you're swept away into this world and you believe that these people are who they say they are and who they're pretending to be. And so something that happens, I think, to actors is um, the bar uh, is continually raised um, for you to experience the suspension of disbelief. So um, I think people have to be, everything about a show, the performance, the direction, everything has to be really top-notch for um, a professional, you know, in the business uh, to suspend their disbelief and be swept away. So um, I think that's probably the only difference. I think maybe the, uh, the average moviegoer uh, is much more sort of agreeable. Now, it could be that we're just cynical, <laughs> us people in the business, you know, <laughs> that we just, you know, we're just a little resistant, perhaps, for whatever reason. So it just usually takes a, a, a an outstanding effort on everybody's part to uh, basically sweep me away and take me along for the ride. Yeah, no, definitely. Excellent. Um, all right, um... I mean, if, uh, if no one else has got anything, um, obviously I want to thank you for coming on the show, you know. Um, you, you are a legend, you know. Um, you've been in so many great films and TV shows, you know. The, the list is just endless, you know. And um, to this day, the uh, the impression, the uh, the voice you do on the phone in um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off just cracks me up endlessly to this day. So, <laughs> I mean, the yeah, people... I don't, know if you, I don't know if you know this, but that's... That voice actually was me imitating, uh, it's actually me imitating Matthew Broderick doing an imitation of the man who directed us in Biloxi Blues, <laughs> whose name is Gene, whose name is Gene Sachs. 
<laughs> and Gene is still alive, and I think he's 93 or something. He's 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 still around. Um, and uh, I hope he's I hope he's well. Uh, but uh, we would we would get him so mad during Plexi Blues because we were constantly screwing around. And uh, he this one time he got so pissed off at us. I thought he was going to have a heart attack, you know, because I mean he was 60 something. Then, you know, and so red in the face and he, he got so mad at us. And, um, but Matthew used to do this imitation of him. And, uh, uh, you know, you constantly imitate him. He'd worked with him before. And he'd come up to us backstage and pretend to be Gene and, you know, chew us out. And so, uh, Hughes just said, uh, do some voice. Pick a, pick a voice for, uh, Mr. Peterson. So I didn't tell Matthew what I was going to do. And I didn't do it, you know, until uh, until the first rehearsal for that scene. And I did it pretty much just to get a, a you know, a just to make Broderick laugh. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I mean, um, yeah. So, Alan, I want to I want to thank you for coming on the show. As I said, you know, pleasure. We're massive fans, and we will continue to be. And um, we look forward to your work and that you're going to be doing in the future. And um, yeah, just thanks for joining us. My pleasure, you guys. So that was the Alan Ruck interview. Um, great guy, very down to earth. You know, what did you guys think? Oh, it's so great to have him on the show. He was absolutely brilliant. You know, it's funny when you talk to someone, or you see some of the movies, and when you actually hear them talking in real life, it's strange, very mm. strange. Especially when they're talking to you. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, no, it was great. He was a great guy. Um, you know, so it'll be great to see him in a lot more stuff soon. So, um, moving on. Um, up next, we have a our, our little bit of... Um, oh, actually, we'll do the soundtrack <coughs> of the week first. Um, we'll go around the table. Steve? Okay, soundtrack of the week. I was going to suggest James Horner's main theme uh, from Kroll, 1983, but because, obviously, um, Alan Ruck came on the show, well, I'm going to have to say it's Oh Yeah by Yellow from Ferris Bueller's oh, Day Off. Yeah. And it's also from uh, Secret of My Success as well, starring Michael J. Fox, which he obviously did, uh, he co-starred with in Spin City. Mm. Very good. So listen to that, everyone. Uh, lots Mine is off the Into the Wilds movie, off the soundtrack of that. If you haven't seen the movie Into the Wild, it's definitely worth a watch. The whole soundtrack is done by Eddie Vedder. Wow. Do you know who Eddie Vedder is? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do? He's the singer from Pearl Jam, just in case you didn't. He's the singer of Pearl Jam. Um, anyway, he's done, he done pretty much the whole thing, but there's one track on there called uh, Guaranteed. It's cool. And um, it won an award for the best original song. And it was, uh, yeah, just a really solid soundtrack in general. But that song stands out. It's really good. So, yeah, Eddie Vedder, guaranteed, from Into the Wild. Awesome. <coughs> uh, my one is it's the main title thing from, although it's an absolute guff, <laughs> an absolute guff movie, well, it's not, it's not that bad, actually. I quite like it. But um, a lot of people say it's good movies. Uh, you know the film Knowing with Nicolas Cage? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> See, yeah. here we go. But you've got to listen to it. It's the main title thing uh, by Marco Beltrami. Right. He done... Um, see, I like his work. I always listen to all his work because I'm a huge fan, obviously, of the Scream films, but of, of the Scream soundtrack, or the score, should I say, is absolutely awesome. And, um, I mean, he's done a lot of stuff recently, sort of blown up. He's been doing, um, you know, like uh, World War Z, uh, the Wolverine, the new Wolverine movie, um, things like that. But it's actually a really eerie track. Because, uh, I mean, I don't know if you remember it, uh, the beginning of Knowing, it sort of starts from out in space and it just sort of pans forward, like at night time with all the street lights. It's not a, probably not a memorable movie for you, but... Yeah, I was going to say, are you accusing us of actually watching that film? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it's a good track. It's a really good, eerie, creepy track. You should definitely give it a listen. I'm quite disappointed. I actually thought you were going to talk about Frozen for a second. <laughs> no, no, no. No, you'll see that on the, on the YouTube channel this week. I was going to say, yeah, did you get the interview with your daughter about Frozen? Yeah, I've got it. I've got the whole thing done. I just need to edit the whole episode. But, um, yeah... I, w I was going to say um, the Tron soundtrack, um, Tron Legacy, Daft Punk, 
but there's there's too many tracks on there to sort of point out. Any of you listen to it? Not really. The no, film's I haven't. Shit, no. Yeah, the film's a bit shy, but soundtrack's really good. But anyway, yeah. So last but by no means least was a little bit of homework. Uh, I was going to rewatch the Transformers trilogy because I hadn't seen two and three since they'd come out pretty much mm-hmm. and um, Loz was going to watch Lord of the Rings so do you want to go first Loz? Sure um, so I started watching the first one and then I watched the second one and now I'm on to the third one right they're, they're very long movies <laughs> and I've been watching the uh, theatrical release so the extended oh. edition would be an extra 45 minutes of Filler, I guess. No, no, that's where you're missing out. That is where you're missing out. You have to watch the extended versions to get the best from Lord of the Rings. The best in wasting more of your life. You say that. There's so much filler in the first one as it is. (laughs) One of my bits that got me the most, and I just thought that was pointless. When Gandalf walks to see Sauron, right? (laughs) He walks in, and they have that little altercation. And he locks the doors. Yeah? Do you know what bit I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah? So he walks in, he locks doors behind him, and he goes, oh, okay, he's locked in that room. No, no, he has to run to another set of doors that he locks. And he goes, okay, so he's locked two doors. No, no, then he runs to another set, he locks that, and then another set. So he locks four set of doors. Why couldn't he just go, boom, all the doors close? Good. Instead of wasting five minutes of my life... Shutting doors. Because he's a dick. He's toying with his, like, victim. He's he, mugging he him off. He could have just gone, bang, close doors. Because it's, it's like a piss take. You just imagine him doing it and then, like, a window shuts and then, like, there's a guy on the toilet and the toilet flushes and then that <laughs> shuts. And it's just, it just really... <laughs> Gandalf what? gets in the bathroom and tries to escape, <laughs> get escape down the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> like in train, train spotting. <laughs> you shall not pass. <laughs> As I've got constipation. <laughs> Have you seen um, that video on YouTube of like the old man in a Gandalf costume <laughs> on the train tracks? Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. You shall not pass. <laughs> the other thing I've got is um, Sam on, on that, on the quotes. Flight of the Concord really ruined that movie for me. <laughs> Cause they, they, they do a song about Lord of the Rings and they rip off all the, all the quotes. So actually seeing them in context in the film just makes me laugh. Like when they go, you have my sword and my bow and my axe. That cracked me up. <laughs> because in the, in the video they make, then when they're sword fighting, you just see one of them clapping scissors together to make the noise of, uh, swords clashing. <laughs> and every time there was a sword fight, I just imagined him doing that to make the sound effect. So that definitely ruined it for me. <laughs> um, the other thing that gets me is Frodo just annoys the piss out of me. He's just the most whingy, annoying person. Like if a, if a wizard who's clearly quite powerful goes to you, do not put this ring on. Don't put it on. Whatever you do, just leave it. He puts it on four times in the first movie. Because he said, he said, do not put it on. It's like, don't touch that button. Well, this button. Yeah, that button. Oh, don't step on the grass. Well, this grass. <laughs> like he's, if Frodo's just like a, he's like a kid with ADHD. Like, he's sitting there, there's all this fighting going on, and he just goes, oh, that's shiny, and just walks off in a fucking random direction, and then gets stabbed, or gets fucking shot at, or just, just stay where you are. Stop being a cock. You've got a whole army of people protecting you. Stop trying to be the fucking hero and just go with the group. Stop being a prick. <laughs> you do it, Frodo. <laughs> yeah, stop it. The other one that gets me, and this is my last sort of thing, is I feel really sorry for Sean Bean. Because lately, all the things I've seen him in, he dies very, very early. What do you mean lately? Like, well, he died in Game of Thrones pretty That's... early, as in the third episode. Spoiler alert. That's his entire career. It's not like it's not like a recent conscious decision that of just dying. Sean Bean dies. That's what he does. That's all he does. It's like that film, you know, John dies at the end. All this film should be called Sean Bean dies at the beginning. For England, James. Yeah, like you can just imagine him going in for an interview and they go, oh, "We've got the perfect part for you. You're going to play a." A bear of the ring, so you're gonna, you know, take Frodo around and really try and help him out and make sure he gets that ring to mount it. Oh, you're gonna die. 
<laughs> but don't worry about that. You're gonna. Oh, I think you would have guessed it for the fact the book has been out for like <laughs> 50 years before the fucking film was made. It's not like he went into the park going, "Oh, what do you mean I die?" <laughs> the thing that got me is like I was watching it with with my wife, and she knows she's read the book and stuff. And I felt like a couple of times she knew more about what was going on because she's read the book. And I don't think they explain very well what's going on in the movie in some parts. That's why you need the extended edition. <clears throat> <laughs> well, look, I enjoyed the movies, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm up to the third one because I want to see what happens. Um, I still think Sam and Frodo are just going to turn out to be homo. <coughs> Mate, it's not, not far from the truth, to be honest. <laughs> oh, okay. um, Aragon has got just the most well cut jaw I think I've ever seen in any man. <laughs> his dimple, you just get lost in his dimple. Like you try and watch him and you just stuck. You're sure not going to turn out homo at the end of it as well? Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, right, this is <clears throat> completely off topic. Every time I see someone, I don't know whether people do this, this is going to make me sound real weird. But when you, when you see them, they've got that well cut jaw. Do you ever imagine what their penis looks like and go, maybe their penis has got a really well cut jaw as well? And a dimple on it. A really sort of angular sort of <laughs> cleft <laughs> ball sack. <laughs> yeah. That might just be me, but... Uh, I think yeah, it is. Yeah, so that's... <laughs> I'm going to say, say that was you. Um, we can poll people out there. Anyone listening <laughs> who would like to uh, sort of like talk to us on Twitter... <clears throat> is that a thing? Is you know, if you, if you ever woke up, jaw, send a picture of your penis to us. <laughs> <laughs> At Lawrence Head One. <laughs> Um, well, was, yeah, a couple of the lines made me laugh, like, um, toss me. That was a good one. That made me laugh. Hey, and no what do you smell? Me. What do you smell? Man flesh. <laughs> and then when I looked from the, uh, the IMD, he's actually credited as man flesh. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, that's it. So oh, I'm liking the movies. I think because of all the hype and the rip offs that I've seen, it sort of ruined the, the wow factor that I would have got if I watched it in the cinema. But I'm liking it, so we'll see what happens at the end. I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah. well, I haven't watched them since the cinema because they were pretty fucking boring then. But um, moving on, uh, well, I was going to rewatch the Transformers trilogy. Um, I actually watched them in reverse order for some reason. Because <laughs> it makes no fucking difference. They're the yeah. same fucking films. Right, uh, Transformers one is it's a good film. It's an enjoyable film. You know, it was. Yeah, I'd, I'm not going to slate it because, you know, it was just a pretty good film. But um, I really hated Revenge of the Fallen when it came out. And mm. Dark's, uh, Dark of the Moon was shit, but I didn't think it was as shit as Revenge of the Fallen. But I've actually sort of switched opinions on them now. <laughs> Dark of the Moon is fucking... I can't, there's no words. It's just noise. It's noise. <laughs> It is just so, <coughs> an awful film. The, everything about it is awful. You know, Shia LaBeouf, you know, he's, he's gone off the rails now, but he, he was sort of likeable around the time of, you know, Transformers 1. You know, Disturbia was an awesome film. You know, he'd just done iRobot and Constantine, and he was likeable. But to the point of, in the dark of the moon, I just wanted to headbutt him. Who's the girl? She's the actor, isn't she? Like Rosie something or another. He played his girlfriend in the third film. She just cannot act for shit. And she's just... Oh, she's annoying. Um, is it Patrick Dempsey? Yeah, Patrick Dempsey. Who's yeah. in Grey's Anatomy, who's actually a really good actor. <clears throat> was just... I don't know what was wrong with him. He was almost as bad as um, Kiefer Sutherland in... Um, Fuck, I've got that. I've just had a complete mind blank now. What's Sentiment. the what's the volcano film I was talking about? Pompeii. Pompeii. He was almost as bad as Kiva Sutherland was in Bombay. He was just a whiny little turd, you know, like wow, <laughs> Decepticons, they come in and all that. It was just a twat. It was just an awful, awful film. And you're right, it was just a mess. There's one shot where Optimus Prime's just running down the street, just turn it like it's like a like a a, a a dolly shot, you know, where it's just going along and he's just slicing the fuck out of all these um, Decepticons and there's cars flying about and I'm just like, how did they film this? Is it all CGI or did 
fucking Michael Bay just dolly shot a whole empty street and just add everything into it after. You know, because that's what them films must be like. It must be just shooting in front of a green screen or just shooting empty streets and adding everything in it later. And it's just a crap film. And one thing that also annoys me about them is they end just so quickly, don't they? Yeah. Like, he just, he fucking punches um, Megatron's head off and he's like, we are here to protect the Earth. We shall continue our mission. And then it's credits, you know? It's Michael Bay's cut. It's Michael Bay's cum shot. Even in, like, Armageddon, he has, like, the little uh, funeral for um, Bruce Willis and that, you know? But it's, it's Transformers films. They just fucking... They just cut them off as soon as, like, the last pin has dropped. Um, yeah, Dark of the Moon was awful. Revenge of the Fallen wasn't as bad as I remember. Oh. Still a shit film. Um, but it was a bit more enjoyable than I remember, you know? Um, I think it was, uh, what's his name? John Tritu- I can't pronounce it. Chaturo. John Chaturo, yeah. He, 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 he was quite unlikable in the rest of them, especially number three, but he, he sort of made it not in number two. I think the trouble with, um, Dark of the Moon and Revenge of the Fallen is, Revenge of the Fallen is an absolute steaming pile of fucking gash. Yeah. But, it has its excuse. They were fucking writing on set because of the writer's strike. And that's yeah. why Dark of the Moon... Um, yet Dark of the Moon has no excuse because at least Revenge of the Fallen had the writer's strike. Dark of the Moon didn't have that. It just basically <clears throat> goes to show that no matter what they... Went, you could write on the set, you could fucking write it fucking five years in advance, it's still going to be shit. Mm. And the guy who wrote it, um, Aaron Kruger... Yeah. He's responsible for things like Screen Free and that, and Reindeer Games, and you just sit there and you think, he's not a very good writer. And he's, he fucking wrote Age of Extinction as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I could say, so basically, the writer of the worst in the See, he didn't write the first film. Yeah. That's the thing. He wrote the two and three, and they were shit. He didn't write Screen 1 and 2. He wrote Screen 3, and Screen 3 was yeah. fucking awful. And it's hands down, Screen 3 is the worst of the Scream franchise, mm. and Reindeer Games is one of the worst films... Of any franchise. Of any fr- ever made, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, um, the first Transformers film was pretty decent. I mean, you know, it was it was good. I, you, you can understand, at least, you can give it the credit for... Well, that's the, one of the subjects I want to bring up for next week. I think. Oh, okay. I was going to say, you can, you can give it credit for the complexity of what Bay had to deal with when bringing a franchise from the 80s kind of back to life. He had to deal with fans. He had to deal with... We well, had to deal with 80s fans. He had to deal with modern fans of Beast Wars and Armada. He had to deal with a massive budget. He had to make it family-friendly. He had to sort of, like, listen to Hasbro, Paramount. It... it it's, it was not an easy project, but mm. by now, there's been no... Well, there, I should have said, he hasn't learned. What am I saying? Of course he's learned. He's learned, make it the film like this, and we still make a billion at the box office. Exactly. That's all it's about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, that's all I have to say. Um, the first one's still a good film. Two and three is still shit, but three's a lot worse than two. I've changed my mind on them. And, um, yeah. So, um, what I want to bring to the table next week is, um, or the next episode, is I was going to say films that had the sequels which had the same crew and the same cast but were just absolute wank. <clears throat> you know, like how Transformers 2 was to Transformers 1. You know, like they, they almost hit a brick wall with them. But I'm going to change that now to 2006 to 2008. Will we ever see a period of that like get again, where we were treated to childhood revival? You know, because in that time, we had, you know, we had a new Rocky film, we had a new Die Hard film, we had a Transformers film, which is obviously the toys of our childhood. You know, we had a new Indiana Jones film. Did I say Terminator film already? No, but the thing is, that was like a period where it was just like. You know, we we had like a like a, a, a childhood revival. 
Yeah, well, we, we no, no, I can answer this now. We won't because yeah. the next revival won't be our childhood. It will be the... All, all the actors nine, are fucking <laughs> dead well, no, within the be, next ten years anyway. It won't be a revival of properties from our childhood. It will be a revival of things from the late 90s and early 2000s. We'll see that again. We'll end up with revivals of... I don't know, fuck knows. I don't even know. Red and say that. <laughs> you say that, but the Flash movie's coming out, which, yeah, it's a different cast and that, but what about Star Wars? They're reviving that one? Yeah, mm. no, th- those those are major properties. Star Wars is a massive franchise <coughs> like, that transcends all generations. But we already had the the pre the prequels before yeah. that period, which would let us down. What about, what about Ghostbusters? Yeah, we had the video game, didn't we? What was that, like 2008? That was as close yeah. as we were going to get. Weren't they all going to get together with the old crew and have Bill Murray again and all that? Yeah, he he was wasting time when he Bill Murray, like, saying about scripts and that, and now, like, in Harold right. Rainey's gone. Yeah, right. yeah the, the next time there is a massive revival, we won't recognise it because we weren't kids to know that these things are being revived. Yeah, the the new revival will be like, dude, where's my car or something. <laughs> but yeah, uh, anyone else got anything before we wrap up? Oh, I'm good, mate. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so um, thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, big thanks to Alan Ruck for coming on the show again. And um, you can catch us on Twitter at Box Office Beyond and on YouTube at uh, just search Beyond the Box Office. Um, my Twitter is at BamSam underscore MD, Loz. At Lawrence Head one And uh, Steve, you're just on the Beyond the just, Box Office one, aren't you? Yeah, and also uh, check us out on rewindthatcast.blogspot.com where I update daily, currently doing uh, top 10 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles episodes from the original 1987 <laughs> series. Mm. We'll probably change really? that to beyondtheboxoffice.com at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so... Cheers, guys. Uh, it was a good show, and um, hopefully we'll have another. We've got guests lined up, uh, lined up for future shows. It's just scheduling them, but um, yeah. So um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.